All right, in the last video, we were really focusing on the idea of free fall. So if you drop an object, it is only acting due to gravity. Um, we're assuming no air resistance, assuming no external forces causing it to speed up or slow down differently than if it was just gravity acting. Today, we're gonna add uh, another dimension to that sort of problem uh, to give us what we call projectile motion. So this is when you have a, a ball or some sort of object arcing through the air because not only is it moving up and down due to gravity, it has some horizontal component to its motion as well. Um, our explanation of projectile motion is gonna stay pretty basic. We're not gonna get into really hardcore um, discussions of how to calculate those values, but um, there are some key things that you should be pretty comfortable with when describing projectile motion from here on out. So to start us off, just a reminder, these are kinematic equations. We're still going to use them throughout uh, because they are going to be very useful for us dealing with the acceleration of gravity that a projectile encounters. All right. So in our last video, we did all sorts of problems like this. Basically, uh, it's an object in free fall and you're trying to calculate some of these SUVAT variables based on what you know. So let's say we have an object that is 25 meters up in the air. And I want to know how long it takes for the object to get to the ground. And I want to know its impact velocity. So here, uh, there are a couple things I know. I know it's going to go downward 25 meters. I know that its initial velocity is zero meters per second. And I know that its acceleration is the acceleration due to gravity. We're going to treat that as a constant 9.81. As we mentioned in the last video, um, there is some vari variation of this uh, on, on Earth over Earth's surface, but uh, it averages out to about this value. And this is the value that IB will use uh, in the data booklet. So this is what you're expected to use. I'm using a negative to treat downward as a negative direction. So if I wanted to solve for the impact, or sorry, starting with, let's see the, um, the time. If I wanted to start for the time, I need to use the equation that doesn't use impact velocity or the final velocity here because um, I don't have that yet. So this first equation will get me there because it uses S, U, A, and T. And I know S, U, and A, I'm just looking for T. So that gives me this equation here. Now, if I wanted to solve for T normally on this equation, it would really stress me out uh, because T shows up more than once. Uh, and if you're someone that likes to rearrange before you plug in, um, that gets pretty hairy pretty quickly trying to solve a t equals scenario. So sometimes it's nice to look at the variables that you're going to be plugging in. And in this case, u is zero. So anything multiplied by u is always going to be zero. I can just cancel out that first term. I know no matter what time is, u times t is always going to be zero. And that simplifies this down quite a bit because now I only have one time and I'm solving for time. So I get negative 25 is equal to one half times negative 9.81 T squared. Uh, go ahead and solve for T. In this case, if you multiply both sides by two, divide both sides by negative 9.81, and then take the square root, you should get a time value of about 2.26. So then we have time, we have S, U, and A, we could use any other equation to find V. In this case, I'm just going to use the one that doesn't use time. So I'm not basing it off of another answer. Uh, so let's go ahead and use this third equation to solve for the impact velocity. V squared is equal to U squared plus two A S. Uh, in this case, I can simplify this as well because U is going to be zero. U squared is going to be zero that cancels out. So we end up with V is equal to the square root of two AS. Um, just to get V by itself, I square root everything. Uh, I have got a negative 9.81 times a negative 25. So I'll end up with a positive, no errors there. Um, and I end up with a 22.2 meters per second, but it's downward. So I'm gonna call that a negative 22.2. Again, the direction here, I'm not gonna be too picky. If you gave it to me positive, that's just the magnitude, that's the speed. Um, I would understand and that is um, reasonable. It wouldn't be counted wrong. Um, but to be consistent here, I'm presenting it as a negative. We're going to come back to this problem because this will help us define when we get into two dimensions, how that ball is going to be operating. So 
uh, to get here, I want to pose a question to you. Uh, if you had a ball that you were about to just drop and a ball that you launched sideways at 10 meters per second, which ball would have more air time? So which ball would be in the air longer in these two cases? All right, it's possible that you um, thought that this 10 meters per second would actually be in the air longer because you gave it velocity, like it should be hovering through. But it turns out that horizontal velocity doesn't change how gravity acts. Uh, and we can do this experimentally. Uh, it's hard for you to see here in my basement. Uh, so check out this video of an object being launched horizontally at the same time that a very similar object is dropped. Uh, and you can see this in action. That is so satisfying. Let's watch that again. All right, so that we can see that in practice, um, the balls hit the ground at exactly the same time. And not only that, if they're bouncing the same, they bounce at exactly the same time as well. One object is just moving up and down, and the other is following this parabolic path. Uh, we're going to talk about that second ball today. So if we were to take still frames uh, and make a stroboscopic photograph at various frames throughout that journey, we would notice that at every moment in time, they are at exactly the same vertical position. Obviously, one is traveling horizontally as well, but that vertical position is tracking all the way down. And that is because gravity is accelerating these downward at exactly the same acceleration. So because the only horizontal is perfect or the only velocity is perfectly horizontal to begin with, um, its initial vertical velocity is actually zero, just like this ball that drops. So we can look at an object in free fall and we can look at an object that is moving at a constant horizontal velocity. Those are two types of motion that we've talked about. We've graphed um, the free fall obviously is accelerating downward. And this constant is moving at even rates all the way across horizontally. Now there isn't anything, um, if we're assuming free fall and no air resistance, there isn't anything that's causing a projectile to slow down in the horizontal direction. Obviously there's a force of gravity pulling it downward, um, causing it to accelerate towards the earth, but horizontally, it's not going to be speeding up and it's not going to be slowing down. It's moving constant the entire time, which means that every point in the journey is kind of a combination of these two types of motion. It's constant in the horizontal and it's accelerating in the vertical. And if we play these two side by side and track where they meet up, we get this nice parabolic path that we would call a horizontal projectile. Um, so again, its position at those same increments of time follows, it tracks right along with a perfectly dropped object, but horizontally is moving at even increments all the way across. So let's go back to the same scenario that we started with. On the first problem, like that warm up problem, we just dropped a ball from 25 meters up. And we calculated these SUVAT variables. We calculated that it would hit the ground at negative 22.2 meters per second, and then it'd be in the air for 2.26 seconds. Now, let's change it a little bit and say, okay, we're starting it with an initial horizontal velocity of 10 meters per second. I wanna know how far the ball travels. Now, in order to know how far it goes, we need to know how long it's moving for. But as we saw, it doesn't matter if it has a horizontal velocity or if you just drop it, it's gonna be in the air the exact same amount of time. Those billiard balls hit the ground together, which means if we can calculate what it would be just to drop it, we know the time of this object as well. Even though its motion is slightly more complex, its time is still going to be this 
2.26 seconds. Now, the velocity is just distance over time. So if I wanted to figure out how far the ball travels, that's distance is equal to velocity times time, just rearranging that. The time I'm going to use is this 2.26 seconds. And the velocity that I'm going to use is the even vert or even horizontal velocity, since it's going to be 10 meters per second all the way across. It's not speeding up or slowing down horizontally. I can plug in 10 meters per second and 2.26 seconds to figure out that horizontally, this ball is going to travel 22.6 meters. That's how far it's going to move sideways. Uh, and again, I know that because I know how fast it's moving sideways, and I know how long it's in the air for. So for a projectile, the key is, can you figure out how long it's going to be in the air? Because if you can, horizontal, that's an easy problem. Um, we just need to know the time to use. So as a reminder, uh, one dimensional motion has a couple different possibilities. We could have an object like throw a baseball up in the air and it slows down until it gets to the top. Or you could drop a baseball and it speeds up until it gets to the bottom. Or you could just roll a baseball on the ground and it's moving constantly the entire time. We would describe that motion as velocity is just distance over time. Um, we have this idea of vertical because of gravity is always accelerating. It's either getting slower or it's getting faster. And horizontally, we say that it always has a constant velocity. If we combine these types of motion, that's how we get this projectile. So notice here, this picture is a really interesting one. Horizontally, I have a velocity vector that is always the same length. Um, so here, horizontally, it's always moving the same speed in that direction, but vertically, we are getting faster and faster and faster. So just like we saw here in our vertical acceleration, if you dropped it, we can use those same vectors and attach it to those timestamps. And then the vector here in red is the actual velocity. It has some part that's vertical. So it's as tall as the vertical is, and it's, it's as long, as wide here as the horizontal is, which means it, it forms a diagonal that would connect like the sides of a box. If you were to combine this with a vertical going up, you can get a two dimensional projectile. You can launch something up in the air, its vertical velocity gets slower and slower until it comes to a stop and then speeds up in the negative direction. And horizontally, it's always exactly the same. This is a beautiful image that describes a lot of information about how this projectile works. This red vector again, is the instantaneous velocity in the direction that you would expect it to be following that parabolic arc. And we can get that by combining this vertical and this horizontal. And again, here, if I were to simplify, once it gets to the top, it's the same thing as if it's a horizontal projectile. It's gonna take just as long to get to the ground as if I were to just drop it. So the last concept that I really want you to get a hold of and kind of understand is how does the path of a projectile help you predict how long it's going to be in the air for? So if you have two um, objects here, you have object or two projectiles, projectile A and projectile B, um, they both land in exactly the same spot. Um, I would like you to predict which one is going to land first, A, B, or will it be a tie? This drawing here shows the path that they take. So in this case, projectile B is all uh, actually going to land first. The reason for that is because projectile B doesn't go as high. Um, this projectile horizontally operates exactly the same way as if you were to throw a ball straight up in the air and it went to that height. And if I were to ask you the same question and said, all right, projectile A, you throw it up in the air and it gets this high and projectile B you throw it up in the air and it gets this high, which one would hit the ground first? You would always say projectile B because obviously it didn't go as high. Um, so in this case, projectile B will land first. If I combine um, this with another concept here, and let's say they don't land in exactly the same spot, projectile A doesn't go as far, um, projectile B, now which one do you think will land first? 
Turns out that projectile B will still land first because the only thing that affects airtime is an object's vertical velocity and its height. So the more vertical velocity an object has, the higher it will go. Um, in this case, more of the velocity is vertical for object A than it is for object B, which means it goes higher than object B does. So it's going to hang in the air longer, um, even though object B goes farther. So with that in mind, um, the key takeaways, you should be able to compare the motion of an object that's dropped from rest and an object with initial horizontal velocity. So just like we saw with those billiard balls, they land at exactly the same time and you should be able to describe how to figure out that time. Uh, so with that, calculate the air time and speed for a horizontal projectile. Should be pretty straightforward because it's exactly the same as if you were to drop it from rest. You should be able to describe how a vertical and horizontal components are independent from each other and how they can be used to create that projectile motion um, parabolic arc. And then you should be able to compare that air time for two projectiles given tra trajectories. The key thing here is the higher it goes, the longer it hangs in the air.